Welcome to the Positive Communication Show with your host, Matthew Cooper, where crisis meets communication. Join Matthew on the journey of skills, techniques, and wisdom on empowering your communication and enriching your relationships. Matthew has been a student and practitioner of self-help skills and crisis communications for over 20 years. He owns Positive Control Systems, a crisis communication and intervention business, and teaches these skills to parents, teenagers, and professionals. Here is your host, Matthew Cooper. Damn. Oh, another fantastic day is on the way out, almost done. And yes, this day will be ushered out with listening to me. So it's a good thing. For those of you that are here for the first time, thank you so much for entrusting me with your evening. And those who are returning, awesome. Once again, great to have you. And let's enjoy ourselves this evening as well as we have in the past. Now, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Matthew Cooper, and I am the owner of Positive Control Systems, a crisis intervention and communication business where I work with troubled youth homes, working with the staff and the professionals in that industry to be able to teach them how to better connect with and communicate with their clients. Now, when I say the staff, it's the staff members at these facilities. I also work with instructors, which I certify, which will then go to these facilities, and these facilities oftentimes are working with troubled youth. These troubled youth may have behavioral disorders, may have drug and alcohol rehab that they're going through. They may have, they may be high functioning mental health, uh, having some uh, various spectrum disorders or challenges in being able to learn and interact with people. Because everything we do is communication, and all behavior is communication. <clears throat> the challenges faced in that community are plenty. And they're also something which taught me how to better work with my children, being able to work with those clients, being able to work with those, the staff members that work at these facilities as well as with the therapists, the owners, and the directors at these facilities uh, all across the U.S. has been very, very informative to me, especially being a single dad with five kids. And applying these skills has led me to develop the Ninja Parenting Program, which is teaching parents how to better connect with their children and to better communicate even as a couple. It's, it's amazing how once you learn how to communicate better in one area, it spreads to other areas of your life. And the reason why I say, I say it's amazing is because how many of you out there can say, yes, I am an expert. I am so good at communicating with my spouse and my children and the loved ones in my life. I know that the message that I'm giving them is the message I want them to receive. Not the message they do receive, but the message I want them to receive. So if you say, wow, honey, you look great in that dress. She doesn't think, oh, oh, he just thinks he's, he's just saying that because my butt looks fat in this. Or he's just saying that because uh, he screwed up earlier tonight and he's trying to make up and give me get brownie points. No, no. What's the message that's being received and, and hopefully getting that message through loud and clear, very, very crystal clear. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way. And especially when the other person is not interested in listening, that's a big, big challenge. How can we tell if the person's interested? How can we tell if they're interested in listening? Uh, something that some people have asked me and some friends have asked me about lately is about dating. Oh, how do you know if the girl is interested? How can you tell if she really wants to talk to you? Well, it may sound generic. And it may sound canned. If you want to say canned answer, that's I've rehearsed this before. Uh, it's not. This is pretty straightforward. If you use these same skills that you're, I'm talking about for the ninja parenting and you apply them to the dating aspect, I've talked about this in my book, The Ninja Dating Skills, what you wish you would have learned in high school. It is the same kind of stuff. If your significant other wants to talk to you and is interested in talking to you, they're going to use some of those same body language cues or hints that you will find with a person that you're meeting for the first time. Now, this is both for guys and girls, and it'll be a little bit different, especially from which perspective you're seeing it from. Since I'm a guy and I am attracted to women, then I'm going to have a little bit different effect 
or uh, be affected, I should say, uh, and be um, responding to those cues a little bit different than other people might. And the reason why I find that interesting is because when you have these cues, they are, in some ways, they're universal. Other ways, they're a little bit different, but many times they're universal, especially if you're the one that's feeling attracted to the other person. You make a move, you start talking, and it starts to move back and forth. It is going to be the same all the way across the board. Other places might be a little bit mm, – it could be a little bit different depending on your gender, your preferences, and the, the environment you're in. If you're in a bar setting, for example, or a club or in a restaurant or in a store, a grocery store or a library or out on the street, I mean, each one of these places is going to be a little bit different. Um, another thing based on this same idea, I, I recently was chatting with some friends about the dating issue and the challenges thereof. Still, if I'm correct, statistically speaking, the best way to meet someone is not online. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not online. No, it's not. That's not the best way to meet people. The best way to meet someone is to have your friends introduce you. Blind dates. Yep. A friend introduces you to another friend and boom, you hit it off or don't hit it off for whatever reasons. However, that is the best way to be able to connect with and meet someone and start dating them. Why? It's almost as if you have someone that's right there that has pre selected you, pre-filtered out who would match with you and who wouldn't, and they're able to say, hey, this person might connect with this other person. And I've found that, statistically speaking, that is the easiest way to connect and meet with people. Anyway, going back to some of these, these signs that somebody is into you or the signs that somebody is interested in talking to you, especially if you're already in a relationship with them. Okay, one of these, one of the biggest ones that I've noticed is there's a smile. A smile, a simple smile, a genuine smile, not the smile of, hi, with a, the mouth is smiling, but the eyes are saying, back off, I want to eat you if you don't. That's something that's just crazy. That's something you have to worry about. Guys especially um, can see this, and they're oftentimes clueless, from ladies um, who are smiling because they're trying to be polite. It is not the genuine smile. It's only the mouth smile. The eyes are, are more flat. They don't have that, that brightness to them. The, the smile does not extend up to the eyes. And I'm not saying that ladies are the only ones who do this. Oh, no, 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 no. Sometimes guys often do it. Politicians, if they really work at it, they help that smile to go all up to their eyes. And yet, um, if they're behind more closed doors and don't have to be pandering to the public, you'll find that they use those fake smiles constantly. It's the smile of, hi, I'm being polite, but back off now. Understanding which ones are which takes practice. Look for it. Ask yourself honestly, is this person truly greeting me? Hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Are the rest of their body language, we call them analogs and nonverbals, are the rest of their analogs matching to the smile? What's their voice sound like? Okay. Are they leaning forward? Are they interested? Are they turning towards you? These are all parts of, does this person really want me to be here? And they really want to talk to me. And I find this interesting because I was looking back, uh, when I was thinking about this, what I was going to speak about with the show today, looking back at some past girlfriends of mine and their body language and noticing the smile and how being able to get that smile, get that laugh, get that that open mouth, hey, that was awesome, kind of a response, that's when you know this person's into you. You know that they're at least trying to be interested if they're just smiling, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh, okay, and that's as far as it goes no matter what you say, no matter how funny you think you're being, nothing gets them to laugh. There's an issue. There's a problem. I know I'm serious, but I like to laugh. I'm serious a lot of the time. And yet I like to laugh and smile in the right situations. If something's genuinely funny, I'm going to laugh. I'm going to smile. And yet if a person has a hard time doing that, um, and you're in a relationship with them, which I remember one girlfriend that I, I had that was like that, wow. Wow, that's something that's definitely a warning sign for me in the future not to get into that kind of a relationship again. Watch also for eye contact. 
does this person want to really connect with you? Eye contact is a way of being able to say, I'm interested in seeing more of you. I'm interested in watching you. This is a little hint as well. If the person is truly interested in you, it doesn't matter male or female, it doesn't matter which gender or orientation, if a person is truly interested and is liking you. Now, I'm not saying that they are sexually attracted. I'm simply saying that they are liking you or attracted to you in some way. Asking more questions, getting more information will give you more, uh, more of an idea of how accurate this is. And yet being able to find these first things, look at their pupil. Their pupil is dilated and they have, they're not on some different substance, okay? They're just – you're talking to them and your watch as their pupil dilates. That is a sign that they are interested in you, okay? That is a sign of attraction, something to think about, okay? So we have one, the smile, the smile that reaches their eyes. Two is going to be their eye contact, huge, big, big part of it. Another one that I found is really important is – touch. They want to touch you. They reach out and will get your attention by touching your hand or your arm or forearm. Maybe your upper arm as well. Upper arm usually on the outside, the tricep area. Just a touch, a light touch. Not a grab, not a squeeze, but just a touch. That kind of a thing for me is a big, big thing that I notice. And this is, this is not, like I said, it's not if they are attracted to you and they want to date you. I had one situation. A buddy of mine, we were chatting. We were at a bookstore. There was, uh, it was a wine tasting going on there, and the lady in charge of the wine booth, she worked at the local winery, pretty redhead. Oh, she was fun. I just had a blast talking with her. It was great. We were connecting. I noticed that she was reaching over and touching my arm, and we were going back and forth, and then I found out she's married. Dang. She didn't realize that I didn't know that. It wouldn't change most likely. She was an awesome lady, still is, and yet recognizing that person can still think that you're awesome and attractive without wanting to date you, it's still possible. So, This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Join Elliot Jolish, the business therapist, each Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Elliot Jolish Hour as he interviews business experts on your behalf. And you're invited to email your business questions to questions at ecjgroup.com for answers live on air every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern on the Elliot Jolish Hour. Hi, this is Sylvia Henderson, Intuitive Life Coach and Energy Healer. Are you ready to elevate and rise way above your normal? Be sure to listen to my show, Intuitive Transformations, on Own Times Radio, Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. Get the inspiration you need to transform your life. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships, Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. This is OTRFM, part of the ION Radio Network. with the Positive Communication Show on OTR.FM. Just talking about, before the break, that beautiful red-headed lady I was chatting with at that wine tasting, the book signing for this author in the, in the area, and how we were able to hit it off so well, even though she was married. Now, I personally feel that if someone's married, that they're off limits, and I'm not going to attempt to date them. 
and I'm not going to uh, attempt to take them away from their spouse. That's my personal feeling. I believe that that is a good idea. And yet still being able to recognize, hey, there's this connection. This is awesome. We were able to have this great conversation. That is something that I can recognize and I realize, hey, I'm doing something right. And the buddy of mine, <laughs> the buddy of mine that was uh, sitting close by, he was like, How, what, what the heck's he doing? He's used to using um, what they call negs. It's a, a negative statement like a, an insult, a mild insult to kind of joke and, and poke at the other person. Where I'm doing it completely opposite. I'm just going and talking to the person. I'm getting to know them. And being able to recognize these different signs is invaluable, absolutely invaluable for connecting with people. Now, it's just not, with, not just with this young lady. I've talked to, to gentlemen in business situations. Are they attracted to me? Well, not unless it's a bromance. I've had that happen a number of times too. Um, I have other gay friends that they're attracted to me. Okay, I can recognize these signs. Just because they're attracted to me doesn't mean that I have to say, oh, no, a person is attracted to me. Uh -uh. They like me. I'm doing something right. There's something I'm doing which they are saying, this person is awesome. I want to learn more about them. Now, don't you want your partner to feel the same way about you? I would say yes. <laughs> if you're with them, there's something about you that they think is attractive. There's something about you they think is worth being in that relationship for. If you're going to have a relationship, for example, with your children – and be able to connect with them and have that parental connection, that parental relationship with your child. Well, it's really nice for them to like you. If they don't like you, it's kind of hard to be able to have this positive, loving relationship where they're going to be wanting to be around you. I've noticed that with my family, with my siblings, um, very few of them want to come back and visit mom and dad. And the reason I think for that consistently, having spoken with some of my siblings, is that they don't have that memory of mom and dad being super loving. They, my parents love us. There's no doubt about that. Mom was very busy with having multiple kids. I mean, there were six of us, six of us kids. Dad was mostly gone for business and work. If he was home, he wasn't there. He wasn't available emotionally because he was Worn out from work, he wanted to go do things out on the ranch. He wanted to go ride horses. He wanted to go and play on his tractor. Yes, it was playing on his tractor. He, he wanted to do farming and, and ranching work as a pastime rather than as a job. It was a hobby for him. Okay? And having his, I don't know, 15 head of horses, whatever it was, on the ranch, great, awesome. Okay, that was where he was at, and that's how he spent his time. He didn't spend as much time with the kids, and the kids did not remember him spending much time with them. It doesn't mean that he didn't spend time with them. It's they didn't remember that. The memories were not as strong of that. And so to this day, getting together as a family is very difficult. My parents will schedule something. Half of us will say, yeah, we'll be there. The other half are like, well, we'll sorry, this time doesn't work for our schedule. And that, that's, that's a big issue. Understand that you, and in this case they, had control and have control over the connections you have in your life. If you want your children to come back and visit you, once they're out of the house, they want to come back home and say, hi, mom, hi, dad. And it not just being about getting a free meal, which, of course, that's part of it when they're going to college, or being able to have some extra money. Hey, can I, can I borrow some money? Yeah, that happens. That, it does happen. And yet... If that's the only reason they're coming back home, you might want to look at attempting to work on building those relationships still. Because to me, a relationship is about a deep connection. And when you have your kids, when you have this deep connection with your children, they want to come back and visit you in the future. They want to come and talk to you. They, want, they, they ask you for advice. They realize, hey, mom and dad, they do know something, or mom or dad, since my kids with their mom, she lives down southern Utah, and I live up in the northern part of Utah. And since they live with me, it's a challenge for them to always be able to connect with her and to communicate with her. She's doing the best she can with what she's doing and her life choices. I'm doing the best that I can with my life choices. 
we all have these different experiences. I also talk about consequences. Consequences are not good or bad. They're simply a natural result of the choices we've made. We all have consequences. You want to drive drunk? Cops pull you over? Guess what? Consequences. That's not a punishment. It's a consequence. It's a natural result of the choice that you made. Okay? Same if we do anything that's breaking the law and we get caught. It's a consequence, not a punishment. It's a consequence because we knew the law. Unfortunately, ignorance is not always bliss and we can get in trouble even if we don't know the law. So making sure that we are learning the law is, is very beneficial for us. Okay? Now with the communication aspects, when I mentioned about the, the couples and being able to build this relationship, having that closeness, how do we keep that closeness as time passes? A part of that closeness, that continual closeness, has to be us making an effort. It is not going to work by itself. It is not going to get better unless we make an effort to change something. Does that make sense? Because I've really noticed it's, it's an issue, all too often it's an issue, that when people want to have this awesome, wonderful experience with their kids, they want to throw money at them and hope that the kids are happy. That's not going to fix the issue. This doesn't happen to the spouse either. If you try and buy your spouse's love, it's only going to last until either your money decreases or until they get bored with only having money thrown at them and they want something more. A good relationship is more than just money. It's more than just a couple of simple platitudes, a simple, hey, great job tonight. Good, good job. Uh, thank you for making dinner. It tasted good. Okay, those are just blah, very basic, simple things that are not nearly enough to be able to really build that relationship. I know I've been lately talking about the five love languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. And I'm going to continue talking about the five love languages from Gary Chapman because it is so powerful. That book, Five Love Languages, he has one for uh, just the original one, which is a purple cover on it. Then he has one for singles. He has one for teens, for adolescents, and for children. It is, it as in the series, is fantastic, helping us to understand why we have these challenges in our relationships and how we can begin to fix them. It takes two people, yes. It takes effort from both parties, yes. It is tremendous, though, what you can do when you recognize these things and apply them. I've been gone more out of the house lately working, and also my schedule's been erratic enough. I've been sleeping when the kids are home and and, and awake and doing work when they're uh, either at school, and then when they come home, I'm usually, I'm oftentimes still gone, and I'm not usually there. So I've noticed that when I'm not here for my kids, the ones that are missing out on their love language will let me know. I do my best to contact them through calling them, uh, through messaging them, texting them, however they feel that it's a good way to contact them. And then I make a special point to spend time when I get home with each one of them, even if it's only a couple of minutes. If they are someone that enjoys quality time, I'll just spend some time talking, being there, listening to them. If they really are feeling a need for physical touch, then I'll give them a hug. Give them a little bit of a back rub or scratch their back or, or whatever. Just something where I can be there for them where they need that love. Words of affirmation, which is another one of the love languages. I'll let them know, hey, you're doing great today. Thank you so much. You've, oh, I noticed how you cleaned this in the house. Great job there. If they need me to do something for them. Okay, that's an act of service. Once again, another love language. And if I had, for example, gone to the store, grabbed some groceries, and I grabbed a little something extra, maybe some ice cream or uh, maybe a little snack for one of the kids that was asking for, say, some, a pack of gum from the store, whatever it was. Those are the giving of gifts. Five love languages. They are not hard to learn. However, even though they're not hard, they are somewhat of a challenge to implement if you're not thinking about them as being important. Once you realize how important they are and you're using them on a regular basis, they will become a normal part of your everyday communication and connection with the people that are important to you. 
And I'm just I'm not talking just about at home, even though home is the best place to start, in my opinion. If you're working someplace and the organization you're working with and working for, if they, for example, um, they specifically tell you, hey, great job. You did really well the past three weeks with this, this, and this, and I just wanted to let you know, thank you. And here's a little gift certificate for, say, uh, $20 at this, this local restaurant. Wow. Well, that's a combination of love languages. That's a giving of gifts. It's also going to be big time with the words of affirmation. They've recognized you for your work and what you've done, and now they're saying, thank you so much. Good job. If your job doesn't do things like that, I'm wondering what kind of a turnover rate you have. Is there something else that compensates for that? Businesses and owners of businesses that recognize these needs of their employees and create an environment that that builds the the trust, the love, the acceptance, and safety. Safety is a very big part. Where they feel safe in working there can change the way that that business operates and, and the loyalty of their customers, the loyalty of their staff, the loyalty of everyone coming there. The way that you treat your people is how you will get the results. If you don't treat them well, you're not going to get consistent results. I'm sorry. You may think you will, but it's only going to be temporary. It's not going to be over a long period of time. Those companies that consistently recognize their employees and do something about it, those are the ones that they have long-term employees that want to stay there. They will defend that company. They'll do whatever they can to make sure that people know, I work for a great company. If you don't say that and you can't say that, you might want to discover why you're not able to say that about your country. Okay? So recognize these love languages are super important in order to get the results you're looking for. Stick around a break coming up in just a few moments. The bottom of the hour is here. Chat with you soon. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of OM Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of OM Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Do you have time to read that inspiring book? Or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. This is Angela Levesque, host of Entanglement Radio. Join me Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern for inspiring conversations with visionaries in spiritual science and conscious healing. Entanglement Radio, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Transcendent talk for the conscious mind. Are you trying to get from point A to point B and need a little advice? Connect with the counselors at Ohm Times Advisors. Whether you're looking for a life coach or a spiritual intuitive, the advisors participating at advisors.omtimes.com were carefully chosen based on their gifts, skills, and professionalism. Ohm Times Advisors, connecting you with the best advisors in the business. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. FM. All right. We were talking about the five love languages right before the break and how important they are in being able to connect with people that are important to you in your life. And I highly, highly agree with this. This is something that I 
use in my daily life. I recognize how important it is and use it with my children. I use it with other individuals that I come in contact with when I have conversations with them. I'm listening constantly for clues on how to best communicate with them. Now, something that that I was thinking about during the break that I've really noticed has been very influential with me in being able to work with someone, meet someone, and to be able to make a lasting impression. Because we know that the first anywhere from three to five seconds, seconds, that's all, that you meet somebody, it's a huge impact. Okay, They see you, they're making these judgments immediately, and then you open your mouth. Then you have five minutes. It's only 300 seconds, five minutes to be able to essentially wow them, (laughs) keep their interest, whether or not they're going to be interested in talking to you or not. Now, one thing I've noticed that is so important that I've noticed not a lot of people use, some do, and those that do really get great results, those that don't, it makes you kind of look foolish, and it makes you look like everybody else. And what is that? Remembering a person's name. Yeah, remembering a person's name. Now, how can that be important? Well, a name, it's been said, is the sweetest sound a person can ever hear. Your name catches your attention. Even if there's a crowded room, you hear your name being called. You will look over, oh, immediately your attention is there. And there's, there are ways that you can remember people's names. Part of remembering a person's name is attention. Paying attention. Oftentimes we're so focused on what else is going around. Someone says, yeah, this is uh, Bob Smith. Hey, Bob, this is this and this. Oh, hey, thanks. It's nice to meet you. You'll often say it's nice to meet you. You won't repeat their name. Though. You'll say it's nice to meet you and you go on to the topic that you're thinking of completely blowing through their name. It evaporates out of your brain and you can't remember it. Sound familiar? I know that with me, that... That was a serious issue in the past, and if I don't take the time to remember, I also have that issue. However, even though I've had that issue in the past, I have found that when I take the time to remember a person's name, I will remember that forever. Um, And sometimes it doesn't take very much. There was a gentleman that I was speaking with today. And uh, we were chatting with, we were chatting about some different options and opportunities for some business work that I do, as well as what he does. And there's a possible connection that we could have an overlap and I could work with him. Oh, great. His name is Ty. I can see it on his business card. I can see his face right now. Nice guy, really nice guy. Worked with Adobe, the company. And um, in... In working with him and in chatting with him, we had a nice conversation, and I kept on looking at his card just once or twice. I saw it, and it reminded me, okay, Ty. His name is Ty. When he left, I shook his hand. Hey, Ty, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, I used his name just by thinking about their name, saying it just a couple of times during the conversation that in itself will probably increase the, the name retention you have for this person by at least 30 or more percent. Easy. It may even go up to 60, possibly even 80 or 90 percent just by paying attention to their name. When you meet them for the first time, if you shake their hand, repeat their name, hey, it's nice to meet you, Ty, it's nice to meet you, Bob, Sue, Erica, Jolene, whatever it is. Shake their hand, hey, it's nice to meet you, and then say their name. Next, use their name at least once during the conversation, letting them know, I still remember your name. Oftentimes, uh, if I'm doing that all at the very end now, it was, it was Ty, right? Yeah, it was. Okay, great. I'd like to make sure I'm, I've got the right name. I'll use that as a way at the very end of making sure I'm letting them know I'm paying attention. Now, if I get it wrong, no, is it, oh, hey, I really apologize. For, oh, no, no problem. You have taken the time to ask and double-check and make sure, and that oftentimes can smooth over any issues that may have come up because 
you are still trying to remember their name, giving them that respect. Remembering their name is even more respect. Now, there are a variety of different techniques you can use for memorizing a person's name. I have found one that works very well for me. This is a technique that Harry Lorraine and a number of his memory books talks about. Harry Lorraine has been doing memory books and courses for, I don't know, 40, 50 years. I'm honestly not even sure if he's still around. However, he, these books are, and his, his work lives on, even if he may not be with us in the flesh. The, the books talk about, and what he talks about is how we are very visual people. And if you can imagine visually something and associate it with something else, you have a better chance of memorizing and remembering what that association is. I use the same method for memorizing grocery lists. Uh, he used what's called a peg system. So if you have uh, certain parts of your body, I use a toe, the knee, the muscle, um, your rear, your love handles, your shoulders, your collarbone. These are all based on the sounds because you're looking at the consonant sounds for each one of those that he's using for these peg systems and then eventually numbers. And then you're able to memorize numbers of, of objects and articles very quickly. <clears throat> And these are some of the skills and tools that are used even by world-class memory experts. There has to be a system, a method, and this is one. And I work very well with systems and methods. If you just give me something that says, hey, uh, do it this way, I, okay, I can do it that way. However, if I really want to understand it, I have to have a method. I have to have some sort of a system for memorizing it and then replicating it and duplicating it. And if I don't have one, I'll create one just because I need that structure for my brain to work. So with memorizing a person's name, what Harry Lorraine talks about is find a notable feature on them. Is it their nose, their forehead? Uh, are they going bald? Do they have lots of hair? Do they have a big bushy beard? Do they have big lips, thin lips? Is it a small nose? Are they missing part of their earlobe? Uh, do they have cauliflower ears like a fighter or a, uh, a wrestler might? All of these are all tied together. What is that notable feature? <clears throat> Once you see that notable feature, okay, cool. Then you need to have some way of associating it. There was a gentleman that I met. His name is Ryan Moody. Well, how do I know his name? I can see his face in, right now in my head. Well, I notice he always liked to wear colorful ties, especially around the different um, holidays. I remember his Christmas tie. It was bright colors and it had these Christmas ornaments. I'm like, okay, that's when I first met him. He likes to set a happy mood. And his tie is like a mood ring. It has all these bright, happy colors. Okay, mood or moody. It gives you something to remember him by. Okay, plus his first name was Ryan. How do I remember him? Ryan. Okay, Ryan. I remember the movie Saving Private Ryan. And so I see the insignia in the military, the army, private, which is like an upside down, stretched out V. And I saw that pinned to his tie. Oh, Ryan, because I never have that private Ryan in my mind. And then Moody, because his tie is just setting the mood where it's always so bright and shiny and happy. Cool, right there. I can see it. Dark-haired guy, nice smile on his face, good shape. Ryan Moody. Okay, another guy. Or Ryan, excuse me, Ryan Moody. There's also another guy. Brian, brain. Uh, Brian uh, Sanders. So how can, how can I remember Brian? Well, Brain and Brian are... I remember in, in school many years ago, there was a guy named Brian, and he accidentally was spelled on the board Brain. Like, oh, yeah, it's only the transposition to the letters. Okay, no big deal. Cool, Brain and Brian. So if I'm remembering this guy, Brian Sanders, well, a belt sander is sanding on his brain. Now, it's not colorful and not gory or anything. It's just an action... And it's something that I can see in my head. Oh, that's how I can associate it to him. I can see that association because he's also has a, a very strong widow's peak. is going to be receding back quite a bit. So it's looking like his, his head's bald in the front. It's like it's a brain coming right there and you have the sander. This may sound strange, and yet, I think it was the Franciscan monks, hundreds of years ago, they focused on learning and memorizing articles and things from the world their religion, for their church, and 
they found that different thoughts, different um, actions, especially if they're of a sexual or a violent nature, are very, very memorable. And our mind tends to remember those kinds of actions, which is why the sander and also why brain, it fits well with this guy, Brian Sanders. Another gentleman, Mike. Mike Pickett's his name. He's a big guy. He, I think he's in the FBI. Blonde hair, clean shaven. Well, I see a white picket fence like a crown around his head. And a mic? Oh, that's right to his forehead. He has a nice big forehead, nice and shiny. It's a microphone for karaoke. Mic picking. Pictures. Pictures that you can associate with. I enjoy doing karaoke. I've got friends I do karaoke with every, I don't know, once or twice a month. By having that association, I can see it in my head and I can now associate it on that person. I can imagine it on their forehead. Or this one friend, um, her name is Whitney, and I've known her for like eight years or so. I don't associate her with pictures, and yet I can remember, oh, okay, she does chemistry, and she does this, she does that, all these different things. Why? When I've known her and I've talked to her and my memory is good, I can also, on her earrings, I can see where I've connected and hooked different things that she likes so I can memorize different parts about her. All I have to say is, okay, on her, oh yeah, earrings, boom. And I can now see in my mind. It doesn't have to be in real life. In my mind, I am associating pictures to her. They call this linking, like a chain link. You link one thing to the next to the next. They're all tied together. When you can link people, link things this way, you can memorize large chains of information. Great way for memorizing a story. If you want to memorize a story or a speech you're going to give, you can chain one part to the next, having the visual cues. If you are instead uh, learning a, a sales presentation, I've done this as well for doing sales presentations when I was doing what's called fund busting for a company called CEO Space, doing a sales presentation. It works. It works beautiful. If you use it, just like your muscles, like exercise, it works if you use it. If you don't, it makes it kind of hard, doesn't it? Stick around. Break's coming up in just a few moments, and we'll be back. Stick around. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Hi everyone, this is Shay Parker, the host of Best of the Best, which airs live right here on IOM Radio every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm super excited to bring you expert guest hosts, spiritual discussions, free psychic readings, and so much more. I can promise that you will not want to miss this one-of-a-kind, fun, yet touching, down-to-earth show. Join us every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Pacific on OTRFM. This is Shay Parker, and I can't wait to see you there. Do you want to be a better communicator? Do you want to better connect with the important people in your life? Do you want to enrich your relationships? If so, join me, Matthew Cooper, on the Positive Control System Show every Wednesday evening at 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Ohm Times Radio. I'll meet you there. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. This is OTRFM, part of the ION Radio Network.
to keep with the positive communication show on OTR.FM. This previous segment, we were talking about names and how important they are and how you can begin to understand the process of memorizing a person's name, even if you've been told and you've told yourself, oh, I have a bad memory or you can't remember anything. Why can't you remember this? Why can't you remember that? My friends, memory is not a difficult thing to develop. It's challenging. It's not difficult. There's a difference there. Difficult means that it's hard to do. It's something that is only achievable through a very strong, very, very long time effort of, that takes a lot of effort from you and difficulty to achieve it. Okay, that's hard to do. Uh, challenging or at least taking effort, that's different. It takes you focusing your time and your mental effort on something. That's a big difference. It's a huge difference. For example, do you know how to cook? Yes or no? If you say yes, okay, what do you know how to cook? If you say no, I say, okay, why? (laughs) Why don't you know how to cook? Someone says, yes, I know how to cook. Okay, what can you cook? Well, I can cook mac and cheese. I can boil hot dogs. Well, honestly, you can't answer yes. You can answer yes to that question. You know how to cook. That is a form of cooking. Yes, it is. Do you know how to cook anything else other than some of these simple box meals? No. Okay. That's a place to start from. Start where you're at. That's the first thing you need to do. Remember, start where you're at and then work from there. Build from that location of where you're starting from. If you don't know how to cook anything at all, we can start by learning to boil water. Don't let it burn. Um, Learning to cook pasta. I was talking to my kids about this. Uh, learning skills and, and memorizing, learning things like this. And they were mentioning that one of their friends actually burns pasta. I said, how do you burn pasta? He says, well, first of all, he doesn't put enough water in to the pan when he's cooking the pasta. And then he's usually busy doing something else and it scorches and then it burns and that's how he burns pasta. And uh, I had to shake my head and yet I understand. I had – a young lady friend, a girlfriend that lived with me for a while, a number of years ago. And even though her food usually tasted pretty good, she was so distractible. She would get caught up and she would be reading a book while she's trying to cook. She'd get so caught up in the book, she'd forget about the food and the food would start to burn. And I mentioned to my children that focus is the key to being able to cook. Focusing on what's in front of you, not something that's somewhere else, but what is in front of you, what needs to be done now. That is one of the keys to cooking. I won't say the only key, but it's one of the keys of cooking. And I won't say that I'm an expert chef. However, if I put my mind to it, anything that I cook turns out very good. Um, And part of that is that I will make sure that I'm going to keep an eye and focus on what's going on. I bought an infrared uh, turkey cooker a couple of years back rather than getting a, a turkey fryer excuse me rather than an oil fryer which is a, a fire issue fire hazard this infrared one it's not a fire hazard at all and it is awesome absolutely awesome it is the best investment for cooking turkeys I've ever made and as long as I pay attention to it I keep looking at it keep checking back the turkey every time I've used it is flawless nice and crispy on the outside Juicy, juicy, juicy on the inside, and it's it's really not very hard as long as you stay focused. Now, with Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners, there's a lot of things to juggle and focus on. Yes, take it piece by piece, step by step. If you time everything out, it'll all come together if you are focusing on it. If you are there rather than trying to be some when else, doing something else. The brain has incredible abilities if you will allow it to focus on the specific things in front of it. Not multitasking. No, no. Multitasking is actually a misnomer. You do not want to multitask because then nothing gets done properly. You can switch tasks, yes. However, that's not the same as multitasking. 
Switching task to task to task. Each one, you're doing one thing right now. Switch the next one, one thing right now. You may switch it five or ten times in five minutes, and yet you are still working on one thing at a time. Rather than, for example, trying to talk on the phone and cook and also clean dishes at the same time. It is going to cause problems and other areas are going to suffer. So by being able to learn the timing, learn what has to go in first. For example, if you're working on cooking potatoes, all right, cut the potatoes, clean them, boil them, or if you want to scrub them and peel them, whatever you're planning for the potatoes, great. Put those on. Now you can work on something else. If you're having multiple people helping, great. It's the timing. Now why am I mentioning this? Because this is also how a relationship works. You can't expect to do three or four or five things at once in a relationship and have them all work when you're not focusing on any one specific aspect at any given time. You have to give it time. You have to be able to be focused in the moment. If you're memorizing a person's name, do not try to memorize their shoes at the same time because then you memorize their shoes rather than who they are in their name. If you want to associate it with their shoes, are you used to looking at their shoes? Usually not, so I like to use the face, the head, as my focus that way I'm looking at their face or their head as I am thinking of their name. Now I see their head rather than their shoes for their name. Now if if it works great for you for their shoes, fantastic, awesome, perfect. I would oftentimes just add those as a tag, add them as a uh, the link I talked about, like a chain link. Oh, link on that they have great shoes. This is the brand. Um, they are very neat. They They have a uh, color coordination, whatever it is. You can add these different things to them if you have learned each step. The, there's a gentleman by the name of Timothy Ferris. I've been following this guy for years. I love him. Pro- bromance going on here. Absolute bromance. He is the author of the uh, New York Times bestseller, The 4-Hour Workweek, also The 4-Hour Body, which was a New York Times bestseller, and then also... He had it independently published. The most recent one which was a four-hour chef. Four-hour chef is fantastic. Okay, Timothy Ferris. <clears throat> With the four-hour chef, he goes into cooking and mastering the simple basic skills first. Cooking in memory. He's also done things for learning languages. Also, breaking it down to those simple things. Is there a pattern going on here? Yes. Learning to swim. He was uh, afraid of swimming for so many years. He didn't swim. He learned from, I think it was called um, Total Immersion Swimming. Uh, the information's on Amazon. You can go to Amazon and look it up. You can also look at TED Talks. Timothy Ferris does some TED Talks too. They're awesome. He talks about his swimming and how he was so afraid of it. And then he decided, you know what? I've gotten this bet with a buddy. Uh, if I can learn to swim, my friend will give up drinking for, I think it was a, a year or something like that. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. You do this, I'll do it. Okay, because he'd been afraid of it for so many years. He decided he would take that challenge seriously, and he went through with it. And voila, he was able to, at the end of the time period, he went on a two-mile swim. Two-mile swim, perpendicular, or per, sorry, pardon me, parallel to the shore, about, what, 100, 200 yards out from, um, from the shore in the ocean, and he felt awesome. Two miles. Holy cow. Because of this method where before, I think he said he swam like a drowning cat. It was a pretty thing. And yet he had to break it down to figure out what he needed to do. Same thing goes with learning a language. He also deconstructs, is what he calls it. He deconstructs them and figures out how to make them work. He's done this for playing the uh, playing the drums. I think he played with Journey. He played one song uh, just to be able to show, okay, I can learn this in one week. One week? Yes. He has a number of shows you can get on uh, Apple. I think the Apple uh, iStore, iTunes Store. You can pick up a number of his episodes of, of him learning these different things, everything from parkour to, I think it's called, um, it's not Kudo. Kudo is the Japanese art of archery. He was doing horseback archery, and that's a completely different creature right there, and he was learning to do that within just a short period of time. So... Timothy Ferris, I love the guy because he's a man after my own heart. and He has these different ways of having a system, breaking it down so it works for him, and then applying it. 
I do it with communication. I do it with the, the martial practices I use. I do it with uh, my cooking, all these different other areas. And he has as well, and he's done very well for himself financially because of it. Okay. These are things that you can also use for your communication. What are you doing that works? What are you doing that doesn't work? Do you know what's working and do you know what's not working? If you don't, this is something to really think about first. First and foremost, you can't deconstruct it if you don't know. In the past when I had conversations with people, I would monopolize, I would dominate the conversation because I would talk so dang much. And that's something I've really had to work on over the years. Do I still like to talk? Absolutely. I have my own show. What do you think? Come on. And yet, even though I do like to talk so much, if I don't give the other person a chance to talk, do they feel like they're being welcomed? Do they feel like I am giving them a chance? Do they feel important enough for me to talk to them or for them to talk to me? If I don't entrust them with part of that time, asking them questions, learning about them, it makes me look like I'm egotistical and I'm not interested in them. I'm only interested in hearing about me. Does that make sense? These are things pointed out to me from friends in a nice way for the most part. (laughs) And I was open enough and hopefully humble enough to say, okay, you're right. I do talk too much sometimes. For those that can recognize that and change their life based on that, the feedback from others and don't get their feelings hurt, it can be a lifesaver. Because if you're not going to be the example in what you should do, who is going to be? We must become the change we want to see in the world. That's what I have to share with you from Mahatma Gandhi. Come back next week. Listen in. I'll be here.